Uh, thank you very much, Andy. I really appreciate it. This is a great opportunity for me, actually, to show our excitement, my excitement in this, uh, in this area of research. And I really appreciate also all of you coming and spending your beautiful Saturday morning here with us. So I hope it's going to be worth it. Uh, so I will, uh, like I said, I'll talk to you about how um, I, I, I think what you will see also is my personal journey, actually, through training in microelectronics. I'm an electrical engineer by PhD. But then over the years, I got really excited about the applications in biology and medicine. And that's what I'll show you. I'll show you some examples. I'll, um, hopefully, they're not too technical. But there's a few graphs, a few, a few plots. But I'll try to keep them to a minimum. And again, try to show you how uh, chip-based technology uh, is you know, finding great applications in biology and medicine. And I have a few physical things here that I'll pass around that you can do in just a little bit. And you can get a feel for how sort of from silicon, from chips, from computers, we can now move towards biology and medicine. So we call it tiny devices and machines for biology and medicine. And the first thing that we usually like to show is this sort of a plot of size and scale, just to kind of get everybody uh, you know, in the same, uh, uh, sort of calibrate everybody of what sizes we're talking about. So on this uh, yellow scale here, I have the feature size, which is going from 0.1 nanometer, which is really one angstrom. So one angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters all the way up to 100 millimeters, okay? And, oh, by the way, you can ask questions anytime in between, or do you want to do it at the end, or? What, so, yeah, just feel free to raise your hand in the middle. I'm totally fine with that, and ask questions if you have any, right? So, if you look at things that are biological, right, things that, that are in nature that have been, you can say maybe they've been built up by using bottom-up biological processes, you know, perhaps maybe a very fancy way to say that somehow these things have evolved or, or have been developed by nature, so, uh, if you look at various things, you have organs, you know, in our body that are in the, let's say, hundreds of millimeters or larger scales. If you look at ants, ants would be about a millimeter or so, right? And then if you look at, let's say, most plant and animal cells, they'll be in a few tens of microns. Uh, most bacteria are a few micron. Uh, and again, in terms of just comparing it to something you see, so the, so the diameter of the human hair, of, the, of your hair, is actually 100 microns, right? So that's somewhere somewhere here is basically the, you know, the size of your hair. So you're talking about things in that scale smaller than that, then there are bacteria, there are viruses that are smaller than bacteria, there are proteins, there are DNA, and then of course there can be other individual atoms and molecules. Okay, so kind of the size scale of things, right? And then what's really very amazing in the last you know, 10 to 20 years, and there are pioneers of this field in the room actually, uh, not me included, not me, but others, <laughs> um, that, uh, so things what we call bottom-up chemical self-assembly. So things that can be synthesized using chemical processes. So I don't know if you've heard about carbon nanotubes, things like carbon nanotubes or graphene. So those are examples of sort of things that are, that are chemically synthesized by chemists and by material scientists and by engineers. Right? And then there is, of course, we've all experienced this revolution in microelectronics, which we call top-down top fabrication, so top-down silicon fabrication where you are taking these large silicon wafers, I'll pass this around, uh, you can just be careful, uh, if you break it, somebody won't finish their PhD, that's all, so, okay. <laughs> so just be careful with that. So this is essentially a large silicon wafer, and on this silicon wafer now, you know, Intel and other companies, and you heard a talk, I think, last week by Professor Xu Ling Li, how we can make nanoscale structures on that wafer, so that's called top-down fabrication, so a system on a board, systems on a chip, uh, and then what's amazing is that today, semiconductor industry, you know, we can make features on these large wafers. Uh, this is actually then a smaller wafer, a little bit older, that shows some patterns, so you can pass that around also. Um, and we can make features that are actually the same size as viruses. We can make features using these, these technologies that are the same size as proteins, DNA, bacteria. As a matter of fact, these biological like cells are actually much, much larger than what you find on your chip. So it's pretty amazing that engineering has advanced to a point where you can, you can actually marry these three worlds actually from silicon, sort of this top-down fabrication, this chemical synthesis, and then biological. So that's really, you know, we're trying to, there's lots of people on campus and myself and others that are trying to integrate these worlds in terms of using sensors from silicon to then apply to biology and medicine. You can make very sensitive detectors, you can make sensors, and I'll show you examples of sort of blood cell counters from a chip. You can make uh, sensors for detect cancer, and you can make other, other interesting things that, are, that have a real impact. So that's kind of the, the size and scale. Does that make sense? Any questions? 
Yeah? All right. Okay. And then also there is another uh, technology that is really kind of gaining a lot of attention. If you've heard of 3D printing, has anyone heard of 3D printing? Okay, great. Lots of people have. So 3D printing also is kind of fits in that somewhere in the size scale of uh, you know microns to centimeter scale. You can also now design something on a CAD station and use a laser to polymerize a material and actually print, essentially 3D print different structures and make these prototypes. So that's also a very exciting technology and there's really, this is a busy slide, but there's a lot of very interesting possibility in terms of fabricating, fabricating at, at these scales structures that can interface with biology and medicine, okay? So, let me tell you a couple of this, uh, you know, so if you look at sort of evolution of technology, this is kind of, I guess, uh, my perspective of, uh, you know, years ago, I guess early in the century, there was a vacuum tube technology, right, that changed the world at that time, around World War I, World War II. Uh, then the semiconductor technology was invented, and that changed the world as we see it, you know, all these gadgets that you have in your hands. Um, and then the question is, what's next? So is nanotechnology going to be one of those sort of, you know, revolutions? And I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, very exciting applications, but certainly, uh, you know, I think that the intersection of uh, modern biology, nanotechnology, uh, that is a very exciting area. So things like, you know, personalized therapeutics and diagnostics, where you could diagnose, where you don't have to go to a doctor, you can actually diagnose yourself for diseases just right at home and then transmit the data to the physician. Um, uh, you know, looking at grand challenge problems like cancer, infectious diseases, global health, uh, and then other sort of exciting technologies like that. There's a lot of very interesting things that can come about. Okay? So uh, just another just a point of reference, uh, you know, lots of people would say that this century is really also the century of sort of the intersection of engineering, biology, and medicine. We have uh, the, the world population is actually continuing to increase. Uh, the projections are that by 2050, we might be at 9 billion people. Uh, and majority of that is in less developed countries. So there's a lot of uh, problems to be solved that are related to human health, essentially, in terms of disease, in terms of low-cost applications to solve these important problems. So uh, we think that there's a lot of very interesting applications in this biomedical, micro, and nanotechnology. That's kind of the, the, the name for the, for the field, uh, where you can build devices for diagnostics, for doing therapy, for doing tissue engineering, for doing sort of bio-inspired materials, bioelectronics, and things like that, okay? All right, so what I'm gonna do is actually give you a little bit of an overview of a couple of different projects to give you uh, sort of our, share our, our excitement in these areas where um, I'll, I'll talk to you about a project that we have ongoing for detection of um, infectious diseases by counting blood cells at the point of care. Uh, and then I'll talk to you briefly about um, uh, some things on cancer, actually, or how these technologies can be used to detect uh, early stages of cancer. And then I'll also talk to you about how we can use these fabrication techniques and technologies to actually uh, build sort of biological machines, you know, a 3D print biological machines with cells. So I'll try to hit all those to kind of share the possibilities. There's lots of applications. These are just three. Um, but that's kind of my goal in the next, uh, you know, 30 to 45 minutes or so. So one thing that um, you're going to see more and more happening is this idea of, uh, on the top here, it's called point of care, uh, or, or, or just, you know, these chip-based, yes, please, there's a question. Okay, that's a great question. So I'll get into that a little bit, just very briefly. If you just hold on, okay. I'll actually talk to you about epigenetics and explain what that is. Very good question. Okay, so point of care sensor. So the idea here is that, uh, you know, how many of you, you know, get sick and then you call the... Uh, uh, your nurse, a doctor, right? And they say, okay, well, go to the lab, right? And give your blood. And, and they would take blood and then they would do, you know, the blood cell count and everything. And then you would go see the doctor, right? Or you go see the doctor, they'll send you to the lab. So the idea that you could, at the point of care, whether it's at home, whether it's at the bedside, uh, in a hospital, or whether it's right at the doctor's office, you could sense and test your you know, parameters of your health immediately. So the idea of point of care sensors. So there's gonna be a lot going on, at, you know, I believe in the space, with lots of technologies that are coming about from Illinois, um, where you could test for diseases, test for your health conditions right at the point of care. Uh, an infectious disease for HIV, where essentially you're trying to count this virus attacks the white blood cells, 
So you want to count these white blood cells uh, at point of care. And it turns out there's actually like 33 million people worldwide that, that are living with this disease, but they, they don't have a way to test it. And a lot of it is in sub-Saharan African countries and also in other parts of the world. So we have really good drugs available for this infectious disease, but there is um, uh, no way to really test it very easily in very resource-limited settings. Now, this is one major application, but it turns out this technology has then lots of other applications too, wherever you want to do analysis of blood cells, essentially, or blood cell count. Okay? So uh, can you take a finger prick, right? You don't want to draw blood. You don't want to do a venous draw because that's very sort of intrusive. It's need somebody special, you know, like with a specialist. You need some instruments. So can you just do a finger prick and um, take essentially that drop of blood and put it in a device and uh, count the blood cells? So this technology doesn't exist today. Um, there are, uh, you know, uh, I mean, people trying to do it. But the closest analog of this is the blood sugar measurement, right, for diabetes. I think everybody must have seen that or know somebody who has, who has diabetes. So you, put a, you use a, the, the finger stick, you put a drop of blood, and it gives you the blood sugar level, right? So that's the model, but the idea is that can we use that kind of a approach to now do a lots of other things from that blood cell. So blood has um, plasma, it has various platelets, it has red blood cells, that's why the blood is red, of course. It has white blood cells, and then it has various other types of cells, and we are interested in this CD4 T cell, uh, this one particular type of white blood cell that we want to count. Okay? So uh, we have actually over the years developed different generations of this technology. Um, generation one um, was actually developed some years ago with some colleagues at MGH, and we are working on commercializing that through a company uh, called Daktari. I'll show you that very briefly. Um, and then uh, the next generation actually is something that we have been developing also, where now we can do many different cell types. The first one could just do one cell type. Now we can do total white blood cell counts and other different cell types, different types of cell types, actually. And then actually the third generation, we believe, would be a complete blood cell count. So actually, if you go to the, to the lab to give your blood, what they would do is what they would, what they would do is called a CBC, a complete blood cell count, CBC. So can we really do a CBC from a, from a drop of blood? That would really have lots of tremendous applications, essentially, where you could just have a reader and a cartridges and a, and a bunch of cartridges at home and you could just do a complete CBC yourself and send the data to the doctor, essentially, rather than having you go and do that. So the idea of uh, bringing the lab to the patient rather than the patient to the lab, okay? Uh, so let me, I just, these are some pictures of the kind of devices that we are making. So the top right, um, and I'll actually now pass some of these things that you might find of interest. So you can pass those around. So these are actually, you know, they look like chips, but they also have tubing to get fluids through. So the idea is that you take, you take the semiconductor technology, but then you combine it with uh, the ability to flow fluid, to flow whole blood, to flow urine, to flow, let's say, saliva or your, you know, essentially other body fluids. So this on the right is a, is a picture of a device that's about three by four centimeters, so the size of a credit card, okay? And this is something we built here, so you can actually put a drop of blood in it, and then the blood will flow through within the microfluidic channels, and you can separate blood cells, you can sort blood cells, you can count blood cells, it's very exciting. Um, here in this little picture on the bottom left, you actually see uh, this, little, this little channel, this little line is actually a channel which allows only one cell to go at a time. So it's got a diameter of 15 micron, and if you remember, um, you know, bacteria are just a few microns, and the cells in our blood, let's say the white blood cells, are about 10 microns. So this will allow only one cell to go through, and you could essentially count these cells as they are, as they are going through within the chip. Okay? And actually, I'll show you a little video here. So this is a, a real-time, um, an actual video of whole blood coming into that port. So what you see is blood flowing, and now uh, you see this little stream of blood cells, and there's also fluid, a transparent fluid next to it, and then that fluid starts to mix and starts to actually uh, destroy the, the red blood cells. So what you see after just a couple of seconds is that the red blood cells are, are gone, essentially. So in this case, we have a lot of red blood cells in blood, so we wanted to destroy them first to then count the white blood cells. 
So you can essentially uh, do things like this. Let me just uh, do the beginning again, I'm sorry. Is that a real video? That's a real video. So it's a real-time video of blood being injected into the chip, and then what you see here is bloodstream is flowing. The dimensions here are like 150 microns or so. So again, the size of the human hair. And we can make these channels and flow these fluids through. And what you see here is then as you just go down the channel here, we're actually looking at this video coming down this way in this lysing module. So we're actually lysing the red blood cells in that module. So it's a, it's a pre-processing step to handle whole blood on a chip to be able to then do further detection and counting of those cells. Right, does it make sense? So we can do lots of interesting things like that where these blood cells and other body fluids can flow inside these small chips, these cartridges that I, that I showed. Um, let me also just pass a few of the things. So these are examples of things that we are trying to commercialize, these cartridges. This is another sort of a cartridge which has a chip inside, but you see holes where fluid can be injected. So essentially you can, you can uh, get fluid inside these, inside these chips and then do interesting things. Okay. So, and again, the idea is that you could then use this in very resource limited settings, right, where you don't have the infrastructure, you don't have power, you don't have ways to, I mean, you can essentially, uh, you know, go to very remote settings where, where you have essentially a handheld that's battery operated, uh, where you have cartridges and you put a finger prick, drop of blood and pound the blood cells, okay? And again, just very quickly, so we are also trying to commercialize this. We are very interested in you know, getting these technologies out to the real world. So with colleagues, um, we actually had started some years ago a company. And essentially, this is uh, the instrument that the company has developed. And this year, they're working on releasing this to the market, where it is a small toaster-sized device. It's a handheld. Uh, you can hold it. It's battery-operated that lasts about eight hours. And this is a cartridge, and actually one of the cartridges that I passed around is, is, is that cartridge. Uh, that's, of course, an older version of it that hasn't been used, by the way, so it's okay for you to touch it. Um, but this would just take a drop of blood, and then you plug this cartridge into the system here. This little door opens, you plug this in, and it will count the, that CD4 T cell. And eventually, we hope that this will count actually all blood cells. Um, and this actually technology has been tested in four different sub-Saharan African countries. Um, we, have, we now have thousands of tests, actually, thousands of results, and the results look very, very good. Um, and this is something that was worked out, uh, of course, by my colleague, Bill Rodriguez, who is an infectious disease physician and our CEO of our company. So he's done a lot of the work. I'm just simply helping them now in terms of moving this technology forward. And the idea is that this would be used, uh, certainly, uh, initially at least, in sub-Saharan African countries, where again, if you just uh, you know, can imagine, or if any of you have visited, we have actually gone visited multiple times, but um, um, uh, yeah, this thing, we hope it will have tremendous impact, and we're really looking forward to, to, to seeing that. So in a very difficult setting where these healthcare workers, healthcare providers can actually go now to different places with the instrument, uh, because it's very difficult to get the people to come to these labs, the centralized lab. And in some of these countries, there's very, very few labs, even in big cities. So this way, you, can, you have turned this lab into an instrument for this particular device. Now, of course, this will have great applications, we hope, even in the US, of course, in, in resource-limited settings or in, you know, people come from far to the clinic to get their blood testing done. Well, they could just maybe go to the local pharmacy or just go to the local Walmart or go to, because even if there's no clinic, there's always a Walmart, right? So you can actually uh, get, get, get testing done sort of locally, okay? All right. So that was, yes, please. In the questions and answers at the end, you talk about there's a disconnect in my head between marketing and hitting all of this impoverished, resource-limited places. How does that work? Yeah, so that's a very good question. We can talk about that. I mean, even now I can make some comments. I think it depends very much also where you're trying to commercialize it. I mean, you talk about trying to commercialize it, there's all sorts of other factors in terms of who pays for this. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, how do you, exactly. So the current business model for actually getting these devices used in the third world countries is actually quite interesting. It turns out that, of course, these countries themselves don't have a lot of money. So, but, but the companies are gonna, uh, these, these, these countries are gonna buy these devices, but they get money from the nonprofits and from the US government through these PEPFAR and other, uh, other programs. So that's, yeah, it's actually, and it turns out there is enough, you can absolutely deploy the technology and a company can be profitable 
uh, if, when you do that. But for the third world countries, it's very, uh, it's very interesting. The business model is very different. In the US, of course, you have to get these things through FDA approval, which is a whole long story in itself. And uh, we, will, we will do that, but over time. I think our first goal for the company or for this technology is to get it out in the third world countries. OK, something else that I just want to briefly mention, an example of these related technologies of microfluidic and biochips is for detection of bacteria. So how many of you have done a bacterial culture in a Petri dish? OK, so many. And the, the younger ones will be doing it in a few years, I think. So you take bacteria. And bacteria, you know, this thing is what infects us, gets us sick. Uh, when you get a fever, you either have a bacterial infection or a viral infection, right? So bacteria. So uh, one of the challenges in detection of bacteria is the fact that you have to grow them over some time, over usually overnight. And they take about uh, 30 to 45 minutes to double every, every bacteria. And uh, so you grow it overnight. And you do it in these Petri dishes right here, shown right here. It's like a dish about the size. It's got a medium that bacteria likes. You put the bacteria in, and then you let it grow. So what we did was some years ago, funded by USDA, they were very interested in foodborne pathogens like listeria, salmonella, and things like that, and detection of those. So can you come up with an approach where you could take a fluid sample, like say a liter of fluid, and detect the bacteria in that fluid very quickly? So currently, it takes a few days or longer. Can you do it even in a few hours? That would be actually a big uh, application. And it's still an unmet need. There's really still no technology where you can do it truly automatically, rapid from a liter of water, for example, for drinking water applications or for things like that. So we actually worked on that. We've been kind of still working on it. And there's a technology that we developed where what we do is, and uh, so right here on the top right, you see essentially a chip in a microscope. But this chip, we actually flow the bacteria in the fluid inside the chip. And we can concentrate them, trap them inside the chip, and let them grow. So um, what uh, I'll show you a couple of videos here again. So on the top right, what you see is a real-time video of uh, these, each little spot, these things that, are, that are, seems to be flying by. They're in a fluid. And um, these are bacteria. Each little spot is a bacteria, which is about a micron or so in, uh, in diameter. And then. This right here, this set of electrodes, we can apply an electric field and actually concentrate them while the fluid still keeps flowing by. So the bacteria is coming in from this input. And the size of this channel from here to here is about 150 microns. And uh, um, here we are combining sort of some electrical principles, apply an electric field here. And you can see that the bacteria starts getting trapped while the fluid is still flowing. Okay? So we can do this concentration, again, of bacteria inside a chip. And then uh, here you see another, actually, on the left is another video um, where these particles are coming in. Uh, here, you see this little stream. And then again, on this set of electrodes, when you apply an electric field, you can actually trap them, concentrate them while the fluid still keeps flowing. So it's a way to, again, do this concentration and processing of these or handling of these bacteria inside a chip. So this is in a silicon chip. Uh, if you one of the chips that I passed around, the green one on a PC board with tubes sticking out. And then when the bacteria is in this chamber, we can actually grow them. They actually, we, we provide them the media to grow them. And as they grow, it turns out that bacteria, as they grow and divide, they actually produce uh, metabolic products. So they take the food and then they produce products. And those products change the electrical properties of the solution. And we can detect that. So what you see here is the relative admittance, which is an electrical parameter. And essentially, you see that increasing as the bacteria grows and divides. So we can actually detect the difference from one hour, like seven, something that will take seven, eight hours or longer, we can detect it in one hour. Yes. So why do you want to grow the bacteria in the first place? That's a great question. So why do you want to grow? Because you want to detect the live bacteria. You want to know whether they're live or not. And the best way to detect if the bacteria are alive or not is to grow them and see if they actually grow. If they don't grow, then they are dead. And that they actually don't do the harm, then they don't make you sick if they're already dead. So for the food industry, for the water, and also for many medical applications, you want to know whether the bacteria that you're infected with are they actually alive or dead. So the information of whether they're alive or not comes from the best way to do it is to just grow them and see if they grow. If they don't grow, they're dead. 
So this is another example of kind of the kind of things you can do. You can, you can count cells, as I showed earlier, from blood. You can detect bacteria, and in this case, on these chips. Um, okay, so now let me give you another example uh, in cancer, and that will come to this epigenetics. But uh, uh, So cancer, of course, is a major, major problem. Uh, I think um, everyone knows somebody in our family, friends, that's been diagnosed with cancer. Um, and um, uh, it's very close, right next to heart disease, pretty much about this, you know, in terms of the, uh, the, the largest sort of cause for disease, right? So cancer and, and cardiovascular are the, two, are the two major causes for disease. I mean, for, for, uh, for death in the US. Um, and actually, what's very interesting about cancer, just a side note, if you look at this plot right here, what it shows is that in the last um, 50 to 60 years even, the death rate per 100,000 due to cancer actually hasn't changed. Uh, so that's pretty astonishing if you think about it. So the number of people that are dying per unit population, per, per, per 100,000, is actually still the same, even after all. What's happened is people are living longer. So definitely, life has been extended. And for some cancers, you can definitely, definitely, we, know lots, you know, we all know people who now, actually even in stage three, stage four, life can be extended for many years. Right? So people are living longer, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, still, um, the, the deaths due to cancer haven't changed. So there's been a lot of investments from NIH on this and from other, uh, you know, other funding agencies. But the, I think the bottom line is that the, the, the consensus is that the early diagnosis really is the, is the best way to increase the possibility of effective intervention. The earlier you can detect, the better the chances of doing something. So there's a lot of sort of investment in trying to detect cancer early, as early as you can. Okay. Um, so here there's a couple of pictures of, for DNA. I think some, I mean, even I think hopefully the young ones have heard about DNA, right? So DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid, it's the code of life for everyone in our, in our, in our bodies. It's, uh, so DNA is this double-stranded structure. Uh, it's got this Watson-Crick base pairing. So it's, it's like you can think of DNA as a twisted ladder. It's a ladder, you twist it, that's what it looks like at the nanoscale. Right? And then there are these different bases, A, T, G, C. So um, the sequence of this is very, very important to figure out. If you can figure out the sequence of DNA, that A, T, G, C, right? What is the sequence? And um, what has been now established over the years is that there's lots of genes have been identified where these genes are directly related to cancer, meaning if somebody has a mutation in that gene, some base pairing is off, has been switched for some reason or changed for some reason, that results in cancer. Okay? Um, what is something else that's maybe, uh, I didn't want to make it too complicated, but there was a, but, but the idea of epigenetics, it turns out that the genome, there is a level of information, right, the, 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 the sequence. So the sequence is one level of information. But there is another level of information on top of it, which is called epigenome, or epigenetics, which really what that is, is that this one particular base, the C, uh, actually, it gets methylated. There is a methyl group that gets added to the C. And it's pretty amazing, the reason I'm just mentioning it is because it's like one molecule, one CH, you know, one metal group that gets added. And that one metal group that gets added can change everything. It can actually, again, turn the gene from cancerous to non-cancerous. So it turns out that the sequence is important also, but on top of it, the methylation, or this epigenetics, is extremely important for cancer. And now there's been many, many reports of genes that uh, if those genes are methylated, which means that one, you know, the C gets methylated, this methyl group gets added, CH3 gets added somehow, uh, then uh, the person has cancer. So the methylation status is very important, okay? So there's different technologies for that, and one technology that I'm just gonna very briefly mention is this nanopores, okay? So um, DNA, uh, the diameter of uh, DNA is like two to three nanometers. Okay, that's how. What, that's what the diameter of the DNA is. About 20 angstroms. So how can we how can we study it? How can we measure something about DNA? So one technology is this nanopore. So can I make a? It's a very simple idea actually, right? Can I make a a nanoscale hole where only one DNA molecule can go through it at a time? Okay. So using advances in nanofabrication that I showed earlier, 
we can actually make these pores. So the idea is that can I make one little hole, one hole through which this one DNA strand could somehow be pulled through, okay? And it turns out that DNA actually is a balled up molecule, like a spaghetti, and if you can somehow get the end into this hole and apply an electric field, you can actually pull it, it actually gets pulled, like, like, like a spaghetti, <laughs> essentially will pull through that pore. So a single DNA molecule can be pulled through the hole, and here, this thing on the right, you see is an actual picture uh, using what's called a transmission electron, so this is a TEM picture, TEM transmission electron microscopy, where you see this little white region, that's a hole, that's the scale is about five nanometers. So we can make these tiny holes that are just a few nanometers, which allow only one DNA molecule to go through, okay? So that's very exciting. If you can do that, then potentially maybe you can detect the sequence directly someday. You could detect, maybe can you, can you figure out a way to detect methylation of cancer from genes directly. So that's kind of another application uh, certainly we are working on and other you know, uh, people are working on. I'll just try to skip through it, but uh, the idea that we can actually use an electron beam. Uh, so we, uh, we have a fantastic lab here in, uh, on campus called the Materials Research Lab, MRL. Uh, the state-of-the-art equipment, so we go there, our students, and they use a very focused electron beam and drill, essentially drill, a small nanopore <coughs> in a membrane on a chip, and we can make these single nanopores through which then DNA molecules can, can go through. Okay. Um, so this is a collaboration we have ongoing with Mayo Clinic, actually, um, with some clinicians and biologists uh, on campus and there. I'll try to kind of just skip through it, but the bottom line is that uh, we are trying to make these pores through which DNA can go through and we can find a way to detect the methylation. So this actually is a simulation from Professor Klaus Scholten, uh, who is a physics professor here and he's in Beckman. So he, uh, we collaborated with him and you see actual simulations of DNA molecules. So what this is is a DNA molecule. It's got a protein attached to it here and they're simulating it as it goes through uh, a nine nanometer pore. So we can make pores about the same size. So we do the experiments and we compare it to the computation and try to match the results. But this is a molecular dynamic simulation and it's really, really cool because you can actually visualize what's happening uh, where this DNA, the protein comes in and it's getting stuck to the side wall. You apply a larger field, it'll go through. If the pore is larger, like the 10 or 12, you can see the 12 nanometer pore, it actually makes it through. Uh, but then the 10 and the nine, the molecule gets stuck. So you have to do all these sort of designs to make sure the, that, the, uh, that the diameter is correct and everything. But using this technology then, we are working on detecting the, that methylation, which we think would be very important for early diagnosis of cancer. Okay? Um, all right, so does that, make, does that answer your question about what's epigenetics? All right, so epigenetics is this methylation, is one way, is one aspect of epigenetics. But it's more than just a sequence. The idea is sequence is one level of information. And on top of that, you have this, which C gets methylated. And it turns out it's very important for cancer. All right? OK. So I'm going to switch gear and get to my sort of the third topic. Um, and this is uh, um, more, something different. This is less uh, sort of, uh, you know, the other two are very, there's a very clear application. There's a very clear clinic, you know, clinical focus. We're detecting infectious diseases, or we're trying to detect cancer. Uh, this one is a little bit more futuristic use are various fabrication technologies. So you saw the kind of things you can fabricate, right? So um, mechanical engineers and other, you know, fabrication engineers, electrical engineers, they've been fabricating these, building these structures um, at the large scale and also building it with materials that are very predictable. They've been building it with silicon or metal or steel or glass or something, right? So can we use um, sort of biological materials so can you engineer living systems? And can we build with cells as a building block uh, of engineering systems, right? Um, so could you take, for example, um, let's say endothelial cells, which are cells of the blood vessels. Could you take cells from the nervous system, neurons? Or could you take myocytes, which are the muscle cells, essentially, that actuate, right? Could you take them and put them together in some way to build cellular system, systems that are made with cells and systems that are made with, uh, you know, soft materials. Not silicon uh, or not necessarily, uh, you know, wood or plastic, or, but rather polymers and, and cells. So this is uh, certainly kind of a new frontier 
And we have a center uh, called EBICS. You can go to the website and look at the uh, EBICS.net. And it's a collaboration between MIT, Georgia Tech, and Illinois with some other institutions. Uh, and it's very highly interdisciplinary, as you can imagine. So we have engineers, uh, you know, uh, electrical engineers, bioengineers, mechanical engineers, with stem cell biologists, with tissue engineers. They're all working together. Um, and you know, we are right now using uh, sort of these mammalian cells. But if you think about it, um, there is lots of plant cells that are very have amazing functionalities. So can we somehow harness those functionalities? Can you think of, you know, there's insect cells that are, if you try to go study just the kind of cells that are available in nature, it's just extremely fascinating, right? So can you think about building programmable biological robots? Can you think about photosynthesis in mammalian cells someday? Can you think about um, cells of the eye that could see in the dark? Can you build infrared capability, right? And there are, you know, animal or insect cells that do that. Right? Um, can you make uh, blood vessels in the body that actually pump also? So, uh, you know, in our body, um, heart is the main pumping organ, you know, uh, device. Um, but in insects, for example, it turns out the heart is the, the entire circulatory system is the, is basically a vessel that pumps. So it's like a blood vessel that pumps. So, you know, um, can you someday imagine having, uh, let's say, an implant which is a blood vessel which can sense the pressure, so as it gets start to build up some material in the blood vessel, it starts pumping and get that stuff out itself. So there's all sorts of, actually, if you think about it, what, what you could do, right? So the idea of biological machines, can you build some biological machines? So when you think about biological machines, you might think about actually things like this, right? Terminator, and you might think about, uh, of course, this is more of a you know, movie, you know, we're gonna go see Captain America today, too, so anyway, <laughs> right? Terminator 2 and other things. Um, but also, there's a lots of very useful applications like prosthetics. Sorry, and there's some great work coming out, of course, John Rogers Lab and others in you know building really state-of-the-art prosthetics. Um, so, but I think what we are thinking about in terms of biological machine is really all living materials and how can we how can we um, understand that and how can we use it to to build other systems. So this, uh, for example, is a. <coughs> um, uh, the embryogenesis of a zebrafish. So this is from online, but it shows how a single cell, you know, eventually over time, uh, does all these amazing things in terms of development, and then you know turns into a zebrafish, right? So how does that happen? There is a tremendous, of course, amount of uh, knowledge that we don't understand today in developmental biology. But then you know, as engineers, can we think about taking cells and then putting them together, fabricating them in some way? to then result in something that can perform some function, okay? So that's kind of the idea uh, of uh, there's two pathways maybe to a machine. Maybe there's an engineered way, which is this way. Maybe there's an emergent way, which is how biology and nature does it, right? So can we um, think about, uh, let's say, take this one simple example of like an inchworm, okay? So this thing moves and walks, right, on the surface, it crawls. Can you study that and can you try to replicate that? Can you build? structure that does that, that kind of a function, right? Um, and um, so perhaps, uh, so, so our, our plan, was, I'll show you what we want to do is actually take uh, cardiomyocytes from rats, heart cells from rats, and use it to drive such actuators, okay? Uh, and then our next step is to try to see if we can control that with light. So there is a full field of optogenetics where you can get cells to respond to light, so can you then control that function with light. Uh, and then, at the next step after that, can you actually integrate different cell types? Can you take neurons and muscles and put them together to have some sort of a neuromuscular control, essentially, right? So you might, you know, build something that walks on a surface, okay? Can you, can you build something, fabricate, using microfabrication technologies, using 3D printing, that builds, uh, I mean, that actually walks on a surface that is driven by cells um, that might, you can, you can actually print different kind of shapes. This, the power of 3D printing, you can actually, uh, you know, so you might have multiple muscle actuators that have this thing walk in sort of different directions or things like that. So I think it's a, it's a sort of an interesting direction. And that's where we use 3D printing. So um, I think uh, in a lot of you were familiar with that, but uh, 3D printing, you can, you can come up with a CAD drawing shown here, let's say on this right, you know, top left, this little schematic. And then you can go print it in a layer by layer fashion. 
uh, and you can replicate a CAD model, let's say at the centimeter to millimeter scale, to uh, a hydrogel. So this right there is a polyethylene glycol hydrogel. That is the same material that uh, your contact lenses are made of, for example. So it's a biocompatible material, and you can actually print features. Um, here is like a few centimeter, this is a CAD model, and you can just, just to show that you can actually print stuff at this at that scale. Right? So, um, yes, please. So that's that's using a laser to, to make a, a, a polymer. Yes. Uh, is it possible to print to put a, a cell in a printer and extrude a cell out of a printer? Absolutely. So that's exactly what uh, what you can we can optimize the conditions so that the laser wavelength is such and the chemicals are such that they don't affect they don't harm the cells. But we can actually put cells in that polymer and we can build structures with living cells inside them. So we can print cells. Like changing the bath that it's in. Exactly. Right. Exactly. You change the bath. You change the solution. You change the cell type, and you can put different cell types. Yes, please. I went to uh, some lecture. I remember last year something about how things move around within the cell. Okay. And I think that there's a lot of footprints. So do we already have that? I mean, little feet. Is that right? The little feet walking inside the cell, getting things around inside the cell. So it's it's right somewhere. So, right, right. I said, yeah, so the, actually it turns out, and there are people on campus in physics that are studying exactly that. They can actually image uh, these little motors, these little myosin and, mo yeah, the, exactly motors that, that move on a, on a let's say, um, a filament within a cell. So yeah, those are nanoscale machines, exactly. So there are some very interesting things to be learned from that. Um, this is more at the micro scale and at the meso scale, what I would call it, the sort of the millimeter scale. Uh, yeah, those are inside a cell, so they're actually even smaller. Those are nanoscale, truly nanoscale. Uh, these things I'll show you are more, you can see them with the naked eye, actually. So they're the size, you know, of a, a millimeter to a centimeter, essentially. Yeah. So, so what we do is, uh, uh, so we take this 3D printer and we can design uh, a, CAD, a CAD drawing. Uh, let's put this stuff one. Um, uh, this right here, um, you can design and you can come up with different shapes. So you can essentially, you know, build this thing in a layer by layer manner and build these structures, let's say these cantilevers, and then you can actually then put uh, cardiac cells. So we get cells, um, for now as sort of a test case, we get cells from, from neonatal rat hearts, uh, and these cells are living cells. We can, we can seed them on, on the structures. Um, and then we can get different shapes, essentially. So you can kind of design different shapes and lengths and different curvatures of these structures. Uh, after a few days of the cells growing on them, you can actually, again, get different shapes. And the scale here, this little scale is a millimeter. So these things are about six to seven millimeters long. So you can see them, actually, in a, in a pre edition. Since they're, they're biological and cellular, I, I couldn't bring them here. <laughs> but if you like to, you can certainly uh, let me know, and we can arrange demos in our lab to show you these things. Uh, so, this is, um, so this is a structure you see here. It's actually moving. It's beating. So the size here is about, is about 7 millimeters. It's asymmetric. We have designed it asymmetric so that it can move in one direction. But this particular one, this uh, one leg was a little too thick. So uh, the cells are actually seated here underneath on the underside. Um, and as the structure, uh, as the cells beat, the structure moves. Okay, you can see it moving. So this is in real time. Uh, these cells beat at about uh, essentially, you know, one per second. It's about a hertz, and you can see it sort of beat. So this is beating, very much like a heart, but it's heart cells on this structure that's been 3D printed. Now this thing is not moving and walking. It turns out because the design wasn't exactly right. And if you design this correctly, this is another structure. Um, which in this case, you see, as the cells beat, it actually bumps off and it's moving from left, from your left to right. Uh, so it moves in that direction. And as the cells beat, this will keep moving. The, this is in fluid, so it's getting the, the cells are getting the nutrients, so to speak. They need some nutrients to keep going. That's provided in fluid. But this thing will keep going for hours and hours, as long as you can provide the right condition. You go from one end of the petri dish to the other, and it'll keep walking, essentially. Uh, you can scale this design up, which we have and which we're doing. You can have sort of mo you know, motion of longer structures that very much like, um, like the inchworm. Um, this is another structure right here, which has a different design. It has these two anchor points. Again, you see the cantilever. It's more similar to the first one. 
but this also has a cell's beat. It then moves from left to right. It's moving in this one direction. And at this point, they're um, moving sort of spontaneously. The cells, after a few days of culture, the cells will just start, they'll form a sheet and they'll start beating. And as they beat, depending on the scaffold you have, you can get this sort of an output response, essentially, which in this case is open. Okay. So you're not controlling this. This is just naturally beating. Exactly. At this point, it's naturally beating. We, we are not directly controlling it. Exactly. Uh, <clears throat> so I th you know, what's interesting is that you can think about, actually, and we are actually now taking this particular module of, or, or this approach of operating in an undergrad lab, lab where, I mean, the students could think of any structure they want to think. They can think about grippers, they can think about stuff that, you know, picks up something maybe, they can think about all sorts of physical structures that you can print, fabricate, put these cells on, and then see the response and measure the response. So they're biological machines, biological actuators, essentially, right? Um, and they move, they actually, the, the, the speed here on the, on the left, uh, kind of, you know, they can go like about the size, about the body length per minute in this case. So about six to seven millimeters per, per minute they would actually move. In this case, it's like seven millimeters in 30 seconds. But in that scale of, you know, they can move. You can physically see them in a few minutes, you can see them be moving. So uh, it's interesting and, you know, you can maybe think about applications, but there's also how do you control it? So this is uh, just some um, videos and some initial results. So if we use these cells that are that are sensitive to light, so there are, there's a um, this area of research called optogenetics. So if you actually use cells that are sensitive to light, then that could be interesting because then maybe you can drive them with light, and that's what you see here. So here you shine blue light and you see the thing move. So this is on the structure with this cantilever. So as you shine the light, there's a light pulse, and then the structure moves. So you can get light control. Um, in this case, again, you see shine light and the structure moves because the cells respond to that light. Um, they create that action potential and the actuation as a function of light. So this is not they're, not, uh, they're not walking yet. They're moving but not walking yet. <laughs> so we're trying to optimize the force and optimize the cell conditions and get uh, sort of a higher purity of the cells and more, and more forces to actually get these things to work. Okay, just very quickly, last couple of slides. So what you saw earlier was cardiac cells, and cardiac cells actually um, self-pace. They beat spontaneously on their own, right? If you want some sort of a control, you might want to think about using skeletal muscle cells, which are the other types of cells in the body that need a stimulation. So skeletal muscle cells, so you know, when you want to move your arm, there's actually a neuron, a brain cell, that's connecting to that muscle cell. And the signal from the brain is telling the muscles, uh, the signal comes down the neuron and it actuates the muscle cell, right? So maybe we should be thinking about also using skeletal muscle cells. So these are skeletal muscle cell based devices and again we can 3D print different shapes. You see here these kind of two legs and uh, there is a muscle strip, this white, this right here on the left hand, this white uh, thing right here. This actually, we can actually form a muscle strip, a skeletal, we can take skeletal muscle cell and actually put them on this device and get them to grow and form a skeletal muscle. And this thing now would respond to electrical fields. So now when you apply an electric field, so what you're seeing here is a top view of these devices. Those are the two legs sitting on the on a bottom of a petri dish and fluid. And as you apply a one hertz signal, you can actually get this muscle to actuate and the structure is designed such that it moves in one direction again. It's got this asymmetry. So you can get this structure to move in one direction. It's, it's, it's uh, responding to a one hertz AC signal. You apply electric field and the muscles beat, respond to that, and the structure can move. Uh, here is the same thing right here um, at two hertz. It's going a little faster, you see. And then here, it's actually at four hertz. It's going a little faster even faster in terms of the movement. So these are, again, made of all of polymer and these skeletal muscle cells, strips that we can fabricate out of. Okay? All right. Um, another example of this 3D fabrication, actually, this is more of a, a clinical application, is uh, this is in collaboration with Professor Jun Kang here in chemical engineering, where the idea is that uh, can, you, uh, can you use these technologies to help uh, direct or regenerate blood vessels for uh, after a disease? So after, for example, a cardiac infarct, um, 
uh, you know, there's a local region of tissue where uh, blood, uh, I mean, you don't get, uh, you get scar formation and there's no blood that can be supplied to that part of the heart. So this 3D printing technology, then what we did was we can make these patches. Uh, essentially, this is, a, this is a patch that's about a centimeter in diameter. Um, and it's got these holes in it. Uh, and uh, it's, it's kind of like a band-aid. Think of it as a small band-aid, essentially. But the thing is that it has living cells. So the picture here on the left kind of shows that. But it's this patch itself, we incorporate living cells. So to answer your question, this one actually has living cells inside the patch. And these cells produce chemicals that then promote blood vessel formation. So the, the, the cells within this material release chemicals that is then directed through these holes in the underlying or the adjacent tissue. So we test this in a chick embryo model, which is actually a model that's used for pharmaceutical drug screening also, where you take an egg and you open up the shell so what you see this is a egg, you open up the shell. This is the surface of the chick embryo. And you can see it's actually there's these blood vessels um, in that chick embryo. So what you do is uh, you put this patch. This is the patch right here. You can see this patch. It's about a centimeter or so. And the patch can be placed on the tissue. It's got living cells in it. And you see also these holes. Because we wanted to see if we can control and direct the blood vessel formation. And you close it up and you let it go for a week or so, that chick embryo. And then after a week, you take the patch off and you look at what's underneath. And it turns out something very, very interesting that depending on the, side, the diameter of the holes in the patch, when you had no holes, you really see no sort of major difference. But when you have the right diameter of the holes, you can see that the blood vessels have taken the shape of the holes in the patch. So you can actually very precisely pattern and direct the blood vessels away or towards, let's say, a region of injury, for example. And what happens is that the cells are producing these chemicals that are being released, and those chemicals promote formation of new blood vessels. So you can pattern that. You can direct it, essentially. You can get a high density of blood vessels if you want. So this, we believe, has some interesting uh, possible clinical applications and we're trying to pursue those. Um, and it's very interesting, if the holes are too large, then you don't see any pattern either. So you have to have a right, right range of holes uh, of the diameter, and then you can see that the pattern essentially can be transferred to the blood vessel formation itself. So actually, students were trying to write letters. <laughs> so, okay, better <laughs> so I think there's some very interesting, but it's a very important in this kind of work, in this sort of, you know, um, it is, uh, you have to be very careful, you have to think about all these ethical issues, right? There is sort of uh, people who work with stem cells, right? The same kind of questions. But we also have um, a lot of things to think about in terms of the ethical consideration of this work. So you always have to be guided by, you have to think about what it will be used for, how it will be used for you. Just, you, know, you can't just do it for the sake of doing it also. You want to advance the science, but at the same time, you have, to be, you have to think about this. So what we do is we actually actively think about it. We discuss it with our students. We have these ethics module that we have developed. Because again, the idea is that we don't want to tell people what's right and wrong, but at least give them the tools to think about it and make their own decisions, right? But, but at least be aware. You've got to be aware. You can't be not aware of, oh, what could happen, right? So at what level of complexity does a biological machine become a living organism? I mean, it looks like it, but is it living, you know, or not? What features distinguish one from another? And I mean, they don't self-replicate. I think we're far from that. But what if they could self-replicate? So I think there's all this kind of hype that you hear in the media. If we have to be careful with that, you have to be aware of it. And uh, again, um, you know, discuss it really early on as, you, as the work is being done, rather than having never thought about it and then 10 years later think about it. So the idea is to think early on about the possible implication and be guided by, by those. How, uh, how can we make these things useful? OK, so I think I'm going to kind of stop here. and. I talked about this broad, lots of applications of micro nanotechnology with biology and medicine. So if you can interface things at that scale, at the nano to micro to even tissue level, there's lots of very exciting opportunities and applications. Uh, it's truly an interdisciplinary field, right? So we just talked about this um, diagnostics for infectious diseases from blood or from, let's say, protection of bacteria. Uh, diagnostics for cancer. I just discussed one approach. There's actually many very promising approaches for, for early, early detection of cancer that could really have an impact. 
And then this sort of newer area of you know, engineering of biological systems. Um, the applications there are less clear, but uh, you, know, uh, you can certainly think about some applications of autonomous sensors that can, that can sense chemicals in water supply or in body itself. Uh, you can think about those, um, those technologies to be used for other applications, like we talked about cardiac applications or other things like that. So again, I want to thank my entire group, lots of collaborators, lots of students and postdocs, lots of funding agency. We collaborate with lots of people around the campus and around the country. It's a high, you know, highly interdisciplinary field, so other you know, biologists, engineers, and other groups. And again, talking about um, uh, biological machines, I mean, clearly, uh, my motivation and inspiration are these three troublemaking machines that are in the back. So, <laughs> uh, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll thank you. So, thank you. We have some time for some questions for Professor Bashir. Yes, please. I mean, one application that comes to mind is people with spinal injuries. Absolutely, there's a lot of work on that. We don't do that in our group, but there is a lot of work in this whole neuroelectric interface and brain machine interface, and also looking, thinking about devices that can, uh, let's say, bypass spinal injury. Uh, exactly, there's, there's, it's a big area. Uh, I don't understand why you use skeletal cells, because they are good at receiving messages? Or because skeletal, cell, uh, skeletal muscle cells need a stimulus to respond. So by, by themselves, they shouldn't autonomously beat. They will only beat when they get a stimulus from a neuron or from an electrical signal. Whereas cardiac cells would self-pace; they would keep going on its own. So there is different functionalities you could get from that. When you were uh, talking about the laser printing of, of the polymers, so any any day that I put a contact lens in my eye, I'm putting a prosthetic against my body that's interacting with my body. So is it is it conceivable that I could at some point 3D print my contact lens in the future? Absolutely. And, and, actually, and I could put any kind of other material or well, molecules yeah, in there? Well, again, or? maybe other people think. <laughs> there's actually lots of very interesting possibilities of uh, researchers on campus putting devices. Yeah, you could put you could think about putting other devices in a contact lens, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, Google has a project, I don't know if you heard about this, right, to detect uh, yeah, glaucoma. You can, you can put pressure sensors to detect let's say, things in the eye from the contact lens itself, if you can add other things. Uh, in terms of, I think, printing stuff, you can, you can absolutely, I mean, these technologies are becoming very pervasive. You can buy very cheap 3D printers and print these things, yeah. If you want to make it biocompatible or put living cells, then that adds a new level of complexity. But without the cells, yeah. We, sh we do demos now for, for third, fourth, fifth graders of 3D printing, which you can, you can easily use. Yes, John? I'm oh, sorry? Could you make the bio lots bigger? Yeah, that's a good question. So you can certainly make them bigger. You need more material, more raw material, more of that polymer. But actually making it bigger is uh, even possibly easier in some ways. You just need more material to actually use while you make it. But yeah, um, we're actually trying to make it go smaller in some respects because we want to get different features at that small scale, but still keep like a millimeter, uh, like a centimeter scale. So our goal is to build something within a centimeter that has neurons, that has muscles, that has different cell types. Could you talk just briefly about the FDA concerns that you have? Yeah, sure. So I think uh, any of these technologies, clearly the, I mean, like the diagnostic ones, if you want to deploy them in the US, you have to go through FDA approvals. You have to go through all those steps. So. Um, for our company, I mean, our, uh, what we really wanted to do was to translate those for the global health application. We were all kind of really, um, you know, motivated to do that. And, uh, you know, it turns out that you don't, certainly don't need FDA approvals for that. You do need enough testing, some data, I mean, enough data, and make sure that it's robust and reliable. So the approach has, is that you use a, a lot of the data, you collect the data, you potentially deploy it, and then you can use all the data when you're doing FD approvals later uh, in the US. Uh, but certainly the US FD approval is the, this is on camera, but it's a very lengthy, <laughs> long, laborious <laughs> process. <laughs> so it just takes a long time. For therapeutics, if you're trying to do a therapy, something that you're gonna put in, that's even longer, that's even more problematic. So actually diagnostic technologies are perhaps a little bit easier through FD approvals. And of course you have to patent all of these discoveries in order to be able to. Right. Uh, uh, right. 
Yes, so along the way we yeah, try to file patents as best as we can. The university is extremely helpful in doing that. But you have to manage that all that. At the end of the day, you also want to make sure that the graduate students or the students working, undergrad, grads, all the students working on the, they are protected or they can also publish so their work shouldn't be compromised, so to speak. So you have to, yeah, manage these conflicts of interest, but it's all very doable and the university is extremely helpful. These cellular machines you were talking about, what's the life cycle before that cell dies normally? Yeah, so um, the cardiac or the skeletal based system, I mean, if you keep them in the right environment, uh, which for these cells is 37 degrees C and having the right media, they can actually survive for months. So we've had stuff in our labs for weeks and weeks or longer. Uh, you have to keep them in those conditions, in the right conditions. So that's one of the challenges in using, so the work I showed was with mammalian cells. And mammalian cells then have this problem of being at 37 degrees C body temperature, right, uh, uh, and the right fluid. Uh, there are other cell types, that there are insect cells, and other cells that work at room temperature and don't even need sort of fluids and media or anything. So we've been thinking about other types of cells also to be used for the machines. But our goal was to come up with things with mammalian cells that can eventually interface with the body. So the life cycle is a matter of uh, how you can provide the nutrients and remove the wastes. Now cardiac cells, uh, you know, do not regenerate in general. They do not divide or multiply. That's the problem when you, when someone has a heart, a heart, you know, a heart attack and an infarct, uh, the heart doesn't regenerate, right? So, so the cardiac cells we are picking, the primary cells, they don't regenerate. They, they, they grow to a point and then they, they stay. And you can keep them alive for a while, for weeks to months. Sorry to extend that. Does some regenerate? Sorry? Does some, does some in your lab regenerate or? No, so the whole, uh, no, actually no. cardiac cells in general don't, right? So there's a whole, that's a whole different area of using stem cells for cardiac therapy where potentially you can use stem cells that differentiate to cardiac cells and you provide new cells that way. But uh, one of the fundamental challenge with neural diseases and heart diseases is that brain cells and heart cells don't regenerate. Skin cells, you get a cut, you can regenerate. But when you get a brain injury, it doesn't regenerate. That's uh, the neurons and Cardiac cells have this limitation, their limitation. Is there any aspect of this kind of research that applies to finding out about all um, So that's a very good question. Yeah, in terms of the whole uh, brain and neuro work, there is a. So I think for Alzheimer's, um, clearly there's a. I mean, some of these sensors that we talked about can be used to look for uh, genes that could be related to Alzheimer's, right? So. Uh, there's been some work on showing maybe correlation of methylation to Alzheimer's, very early stage. Um, but, but I think the point is that in terms of, uh, if, there were, if there were markers of Alzheimer's, in terms of the genetic markers, or, then we can use these technologies to, to detect them early on. I think we've, we've come to the end of the time, so why don't we thank uh, Chris Bashir again and invite everybody up.